He was prime minister, then president, and over 20 years changed the face of Turkey. He has been accused of concentrating power, jailing opponents, and pushing an Islamist agenda. Workers have faced a huge crisis during his rule, but it looks like President Recep Tayyip Erdogan still holds the advantage after the first round of elections. Thailand had elections on Sunday too, but this time the mandate was for change. What were these dramatic developments in the country? And in April and May, we open the climbing season in Nepal and Mount Everest will have 900 climbers trying to scale its peak. Despite serious risks to the environment and the climbers, the government has handed out 450 permits this year. We look at all these stories on Daily Debrief today. Turkey's crucial election on Sunday saw a fierce contest. Recep Tayyip Erdogan of the right-wing People's Alliance faced a stiff challenge from an umbrella coalition led by Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. The alliances fiercely attacked each other, although there were doubts if their policies were very different. A lot of it boiled down to one man, Erdogan, and how he has changed the country. As counting continues, it looks like a runoff might be held. Abdul will join us over video conference to explain what it means to supporters on both sides. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Abdul, a sort of tightrope walk for Erdogan in Turkey. What are the latest numbers that we have? Well, as per the uh, data released by the Turkish Election Council, it says that after counting of around 99.4% of the votes, all votes, uh, Erdogan Hall has got around 49.3% uh, votes and his closest rival, uh, Kemal Kilik Darulu, has got around 40, 45% of votes. Not exactly 45, less than 45. This is the main, these are the two leading contenders. Of course, the third, uh, Sinan Ogan, has got around 5% of the votes, uh, uh, of course, which does not count, but it will be significant in the second round. As far as as far as the parliamentary election is concerned, uh, there uh, the results are by and large very clear. Uh, the leading uh, uh, ruling AKP, uh, Erdogan's party, and its alliance has got clear majority. Out of 600 uh, seats in the parliament, they have got 321 seats. And the uh, uh, CHP, the uh, Kilika, uh, sorry, Kilik, the Rulu's party uh, has got has increased its seats. But it's still, uh, its alliance altogether gets around 213 seats uh, so far. So uh, it's far behind. Uh, the left-led alliance, uh, led by the HTP, the People's Democratic Party, the Kurdish Party, has got similar uh, number of seats as it got in the last election, around 66. So this is the latest uh, uh, set of numbers, which is emerging from the uh, uh, Turkey justice election. Parliamentary uh, 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 result is almost clear, but as far as the presidential uh, race is concerned, it is still uh, uh, time before we say that this is fine. Right. Now, Erdogan had not one but many problems during his, uh, I mean, he's been around for 20 years and there were no less problems. So what explains this kind of an outcome in that context? What were the issues in this election? Exactly. That is the one uh, strange and surprising element which most of the uh, uh, experts trying to understand the election results will have will face. Uh, if you see the pre-poll uh, uh, surveys, uh, public opinion surveys, were clearly indicating that uh, uh, Darulu has a, a kind of edge over uh, Erdogan's for basic reason that uh, he Erdogan has been power for more than twenty years now, and there is an, a strong anti-incumbency. Uh, the, the set of voters have moved away from him for the reasons, economic reasons, of course. Uh, Turkey has seen a very prolonged high inflation, which is still continuing. More than uh, even now, the official inflation rate is up uh, above 44 percent. Uh, so that has led to a massive uh, erosion in the purchasing power of the people. The living standards have gone down. Uh, so that has be, that is that was considered to be a significant reason that the uh, large number of Turkey people will vote against Erdogan uh, because that is primarily uh, due to the uh, strange economic policies introduced by his government in the last uh, couple of years. A apart from that, 
there were other reasons. For example, the presence of the Syrian uh, refugees, around 3.5 million Syrian refugees are there. And that has created a kind of uh, right wing polarization in Turkey, which is against, uh, which basically blames the Syrian migrants as, uh, uh, as a, one of the reasons for the erosion of their living standards and the loss of jobs and so on and so forth. Whether it is true or not, that is a different issue to debate. But that's one, that was one of the major issues in the, uh, in the campaign. And that basically forced most of the parties, including the AKP, the Erdogan's party, to take a position on it, that these Syrian refugees will be uh, sent back home. But uh, it, it seems, despite that, there has been no much, not much impact on the results. The last major uh, issue was, of course, the issue related to uh, uh, the uh, earthquake, uh, mis alleged mismanagement during the earthquake relief, which happened in February. More than 50,000 uh, Turkish uh, people died in those uh, earthquakes. And, and there was a, 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 a sense that majority of the people who are affected by the earthquake are going to vote against Erdogan. But if you see the results, the, the provinces which were highly affected by the earthquake have overwhelmingly voted for Erdogan. More than 60%, 70% of the votes uh, in those provinces were cast for Erdogan. So all the uh, speculations, all the uh, uh, pre-election analysis which was done on the base of these major issues, it seems have no uh, real uh, track with the uh, uh, voters who came out in very large number to vote. More than 87% uh, uh, voters uh, voted on Sunday. And, and it seems they are not as uh, angry with Erdogan and AKP as uh, the pollsters are trying to portray. Abdul, before you leave, um, what was the opposition promising and what would that have meant? Well, uh, uh, the National Alliance, uh, which is basically led by Kelik Darulu, and the left alliance led by STP had a very set of promises. The primary uh, the, uh, the, uh, promise which they had in their election camp during their election campaign was the uh, the idea that Erdogan's one individual centric uh, politics basically dangers uh, Turkish democracy, and we will uh, go back to the parliamentary system which. Turkey had before 2018 elections. So that was the central promise on which Kilik Darulu and his alliance was fighting the election, apart from uh, relaxation in the inflation and uh, uh, repatriation of Turkish, uh, sorry, Syrian refugees, and so on and so forth. The left was also promising a comprehensive uh, 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 reforms in the labor uh, uh, laws, making it more pro-labor, uh, making uh, helping them with uh, better facilities, economic support by the state to kind of uh, help them fight the, the, the economic issues they are facing. Uh, Kurdish uh, opposition, of course, was looking for a better uh, uh, protection for minorities and better observation of their rights. All these issues, uh, of course, uh, HDP-led alliance has retained its support base of 12 to 12 percent votes, and they have got the similar number of seats as in the last elections. But Kilik Darulu's uh, uh, and his alliance's attempt to kind of pitch the election uh, in and around the Erdogan's quote-unquote authoritarian politics, it seems has not clicked with the uh, voters. Right, Abdul, and uh, I'm sure that we'll uh, be discussing this particular election again over the course of this week. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thailand's Prime Minister Prayut chan United Thai National Party has come up fifth in elections to the lower house as promises of reform move Thai voters. Meanwhile, the Move Forward Party, which promised reforms in the monarchy and armed forces, has done well. However, the question of the next Prime Minister will also be decided by the Senate, where the military has a say. Anish from People's Dispatch has the details and he's joining us over video conference now. Anish, let's begin with who are the winners and the losers in this election? Yeah, so uh, quite interestingly, uh, 
the opposition made a massive show of force uh, in terms of the votes that they uh, accumulated between them and also uh, the seats uh, that they won, not just in the uh, the first past the post constituencies, uh, but also in the party list. Now, uh, if you look at the history of uh, Thai's electoral behavior since maybe like 2001, uh, the predecessors of Phue Thai, which used to be People's Power Party and the Thai Rak Thai, uh, which were led by uh, Thakshin Shinavatra and uh, his sister Young Lak Shinavatra at different points, uh, came in second, which is the first time that it has happened uh, since 2001. It's quite significant. And the Move Forward Party came in first, uh, even though, uh, you know, it's quite a close uh, election in many ways between the two of them. Uh, the most significant part is that the right wing, the, the more conservative, the pro-royalist, uh, the pro-military parties have, uh, you know, suffered a beating. Uh, they are no, you know, you, the biggest party is Bhum Jetai, which has about 71 seats. Uh, and that is still not uh, even one of the best performances uh, in the last two decades for any of the party of that inclination. So what we are looking at is very clearly and very resoundingly uh, people calling for uh, more democracy, uh, less military interference, and maybe maybe some level of reform uh, in how the royalty works. So that is how the political behavior is. The entire emergence of Move Forward Party, in fact, is quite significant in multiple ways because they have not only earlier in the earlier election, they actually uh, ate up a lot of Kuwait Thai's uh, probable constituencies. This time, they also ate up a lot of uh, more conservative constituencies. So this emergence is, has actually toppled a whole lot of uh, traditional political equations of the country. Ranish, Ranish, who are the Move Forward Party and what explains the results that they have shown, the sort of astounding results? Yeah, so the Move Forward is pretty much the de facto successor of the uh, the future Forward Party that was uh, founded by Thanaton, um, uh, a very young billionaire uh, who uh, tried to claim uh, the prime minister's position in 2000. 19 or after the 2019 election uh the party had come in second at that point but it emerged out of uh, a multiple set of factors uh, one is the growing uh, involvement or the ele growing electoral involvement of young urban voters in thailand and if you look at the current uh, you know seat distribution uh, most of uh, move forward parties uh, seats come from basically uh, Bangkok and uh, the region around it, the Bay region in central Thailand, which shows that it's mostly urban constituency. And uh, and obviously, the greater involvement of younger people in uh, the electoral politics, uh, not only as voters, but also, uh, you know, as uh, 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 candidates for the Move Forward Party actually gave it a fillip in many ways. Uh, its politics is quite... Uh, unclear at the moment because when it came out in uh, 2019 as future pro uh, forward party it had a certain set of uh, policies which were quite progressive in several ways it called for labor reforms there were obviously social movements involved in it at this point it has pretty much taken up the mantle of representing the Demo uh, the pro-democracy or the anti-government protest that uh, emerged in 2019 2020 and even we saw it in 2021 and so on so in most of these cases, uh, you had several of these activists who were part of the protest movement at the time in and around Bangkok being part of and even winning seats uh, in uh, with the Move Forward Party. So their politics has kind of changed a lot because many of these people do not necessarily share the same vision uh, with several of the social movements. Many of them are, uh, you know, quite uh, outward looking or, you know, globalist in many ways. Uh, okay. Do not view, uh, do not uh, subscribe to several of the traditional foreign policy uh, uh, issues that maybe say like uh, Fuyi Thai or uh, the any of the royalist parties had subscribed to earlier. So these uh, their emergence really does upset a lot of 
not only domestic uh, political equations, but also probably if they manage to, uh, you know, somehow claim the position of the prime minister, uh, might change the course of Thai's involvement as a, you know, regional power in in the in the short run. Thanks a lot for joining us with that update. More than 900 climbers will head up Mount Everest in 2023. Authorities in Nepal have handed out more than 450 permits this climbing season. Climbing windows open in April and May, allowing the mountaineers in. But it does not mean that the area is accessible on any day over these months. Windows that open can tightly close for hours, days or weeks, making the climb equally thrilling and treacherous and the numbers a threat to the environment. That's why many question climbers, as well as the generous permits given out to them. We'll go over to Siddhant Ane, sports journalist, to discuss this season. Siddhant, so the climbing season is back and it looks like the Nepal government has decided to give a lot more permits after a rather long gap. What are the problems that people have been pointing out about this sort of mad rush to scale the peak? Uh, there's a whole host of problems, Pagya. It's unsurprising for a couple of reasons, uh, the volume of permits that have been issued, uh, particularly to foreign climbers, uh, because it's the 70th anniversary this year of uh, the Tenjin Norge and uh, Edmund Hillary's first ascent of Everest back in '53. So, uh, obviously, a lot of people want to be associated with that historical fact in some way or the other, and therefore, uh, that coupled with the, the reduction, uh, the shortening of the climbing season, as well as the reduction in the permits issued during the pandemic, uh, means that, you know, from both the economic perspective uh, of what these climbers bring in to Nepal when they come to uh, to visit Everest, um, as well as from, uh, of course, uh, the pressures from the mountaineering community and, and uh, you know, the other aspects, uh, of course, uh, the livelihoods of the Sherpa community that lives in this region is uh, pretty much entirely dependent on the influx of visitors. So uh, there's pressure there as well uh, to make sure that, you know, things continue. So a, a combination of these factors has, I think, led to, and also I think um, after a couple of years of quite difficult weather-wise conditions, uh, there's hope uh, that, you know, more people will be able to make it to the top. Um, of course, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about uh, the issues related to that. Uh, but it's everything from, you know, a few years ago, uh, a research study was done which found microplastics uh, in both the water as well as the snow uh, from samples collected at Everest. Um, recent surveys have shown that almost 100% of people who go up to these higher altitude areas, mountains, etc., uh, have now in, uh, encountered some kind of plastic uh, waste. Uh, you know, either on trails or or even sometimes on top. Uh, so now from the from Mount Everest, which is the, the highest point, to the Mariana Trench, which is the lowest point, microplastics are everywhere. Uh, and uh, this year, I think plastic pollution is the theme for World Environment Day. You know, so so a lot of people are, t are talking about the issue of plastic pollution, but uh, not enough focus, I think, as a consequence on the uh, lives and livelihoods of the communities who actually are the backbone of this entire human endeavor to climb the high speed. Right. Uh, they provide all the logistical support, all the expertise. They prevent half, uh, also, uh, sorry, not to use a statistical term, but they prevent a lot of uh, potential disasters from taking place. One third of all climbers who die on Everest are Sherpas. Uh, you know, and this is, this is actually just dying on Everest. It doesn't take into account uh, the kind of physical and other uh, trauma their bodies go through uh, through years of being exposed to what's called the death zone uh, above 20,000 uh, feet above sea level when, when oxygen levels are so low that your brain is literally getting fried. Uh, so so uh, not enough attention to that aspect, despite the best efforts of the climbing community. The fact is that these communities remain quite small. Um, and so it's the effort of once in a while breakaways, like we will talk about later, uh, who become achieve some kind of fame or celebrity status that goes beyond just those that are directly involved in in, um, in climbing. Then they are able to assert other kinds of pressures. Uh, but as of now, it's a difficult uh, balance to be found, uh, Pragya, between maintaining what is a very fragile ecosystem. 
uh, or or at least uh, if it is it can be called an ecosystem but a fragile part of the world uh, and the very uh, real facts may be coming from years of misgovernance or deliberately done in such a way uh, that means that basically this entire community if uh, this sort of tourism were to stop would find it extremely difficult to earn a decent and have a decent life sudhant and you know sudhant also what strikes me is i think pasang davas has made 26 climbs and he still I, i was shocked to learn that he still hasn't broken the record he's he's at a tie now so he has to he has to go yeah. 27th time i mean this kind of pressure and it comes with a sense of achievement as well so i suppose that's behind the inability to control uh, and that's also why both the climbers and the government of nepal often gets you know uh, criticized yeah it, i mean so many things uh, pragya so so the pressure is also from uh, kami rita who's the joint holder of the record and whose round will come to take his lot of uh, right. you know was up later in the season whenever it does probably in the next few days uh, so so when that happens and hopefully of course we always hope for a successful ascent uh, that will be make it 27 so again the record would be broken and so of course there is that that part but i think you know like uh, like many of these climbers who are kind of ha- are doing this regularly one is to remain relevant and to remain be able to tell their stories they have to keep climbing right the minute you stop and you retire and you and you go go off to your village and, and you have a peaceful life there you can then your limit uh, your impact on the wider community is limited so like 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 these guys have often said that if we had access to proper education uh, if we had you know the, the kind of other resources that other citizens of nepal perhaps get those living in kathmandu and other places uh, then our young people would not be forced into this most dangerous occupation uh, i don't th- i of course some uh, climb of this climbing and record breaking is ego fuel but for for a lot of uh, these people it's also a multitude of other factors including the fact that if you set up a company where you can then employ let's say 100 kids from the region right all of your clients then who are spending 50 60 70 000 us dollars to come they want you to personally guide them to the top because one nobody wants to die and two they want to hear your stories they want to tell people that they have been guided by the climber who has climbed everest the most time right right there's also a personal duty that these sherpas take on and that's why we've heard so many heroic stories of the kind of rescue attempts they made the kind of rescues they've done which is that once they take on the duty of care towards these clients they have become uh, responsible beyond just the legal responsibility they also kind of assume that responsibility of how you will behave on the mountain uh, how you will interact with it and 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 uh, and bringing you back home safe so uh, it's a combination of all of these factors that i think makes it an extremely interesting uh, story for for the rest of us also uh, but one that needs to be addressed from a political uh, point of view very soon as well because otherwise I, I, it's unsustainable at this point uh, otherwise and uh, uh, nims uh, N- uh, i forget his full name is called nims uh, the the climber who recently a very in a very short time climbed all the right uh 8000 plus peaks and has a, a documentary that did very well out on netflix i think uh, 14 peaks uh so he, these kind of people have started talking about these issues so we can only hope that there'll be more stories more uh, conversations around it and and that's the only possible way that i guess a longer term solution can be uh, worked at right on great thanks for joining us And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow and for more such stories visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and also follow us on your social media of choice.